Okay, uh, as, as most of you know, uh, the name of our organization is the Dickinson Music Enrichment Center. And what we propose to do, we're a startup nonprofit, and what we're proposing to do is to offer free music lessons uh, for uh, economically disadvantaged kids in the uh, Dickinson, Texas area. And we, uh, we want to start that off at fourth and fifth grade because the Dickinson ISD doesn't have a band program until sixth grade. And, and what we found through, through research and through other, uh, through other programs is that the earlier you can start kids off in a music program, the better, the better that their entire educational career will be throughout, throughout grade school and into high school. And uh, our programs start, like I said, fourth grade and fifth grade are beginning programs and seventh and eighth are intermediate. And we do have, uh, we wanna provide some availability for uh, high school students from freshman to uh, senior to come in and have some lessons to improve their technique and, uh, and, uh, and their musicianship as per what the uh, high school band director requires from them. You know, he may come along and say, you need uh, a little bit more help here, a little bit more there. And if they, you know, they're from a background where they can't afford to get that help, then they can come to us and, and we'll, we'll find them some, uh, some teachers and instructors and a location, hopefully, for those guys to come in and, and take advantage of, of our program. Also, I forgot, almost one of our other initiatives that we have is that once they're with us for a year in our program, typically in, in the fifth grade, if they do an entire year, when they go to sixth grade and uh, they can't afford the rental of the instruments or the purchase one, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll step in and provide an instrument for them as well. And that's kind of a, a real quick synopsis of, of what, we're, what we're planning. I mean, future long range goals, we'd like to open up, start with uh, a school in Dickinson and also in South Houston, uh, Third Ward and Greens Point. And those are areas where uh, uh, low income availability for this type of program uh, is, is scarce, if, if, not, if not non-existent altogether. I'm going to let the panel uh, start to chime in. Uh, you want to start? I keep seeing Lynn saying, wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who wants to start? Any of you? Maybe I could throw a question out there real quick and, and somebody can hop in and have something. What, what I'm finding in, in uh, when I, because I'm doing, I also do the grant right now. What I'm finding is that a lot of uh, foundations want us to have as part of our submittal package an audited financial statement, which is really kind of difficult for a startup to to provide. And and I'd like to get some someone's uh, input if they have any on how I can accomplish this. Without limited, can I, can I ask the um, the revenue for your organization? What's the annual revenue? Uh, right now, our, re our annual revenue we uh, probably have been able to to get about three about three thousand dollars so far in donations. And like I said, we're when I say uh, newly started. Uh, we mm -hmm. started in, we got our 501c3 in February. <laughs> so we are fresh, fresh out of the box started, yes. So um, I know Lynn and, and Justin with their background in um, nonprofit finance, uh, you know, will probably address this, but your state usually will determine when you are required to have um, audited statements uh, and it's usually a certain threshold um, so you may want to ask you know I'll just throw this out you may want to ask if uh, just a, a you know financial review or uh, something because you're just starting is sufficient and you may have to go with smaller funders uh, until you build up to that point but I think between Lynn and Justin they can address that 
Well, I think one just critical question, which is sidestepping that a little bit, which is just thinking, you know, what's your sense when when you tell the story about what it takes to actually deliver what it is that you want to do, um, how well you're able to articulate the the resources that are involved. So not just the, the money component, but um, beginning to tell that story, and particularly since you are new, and since there isn't a, you know, you're not talking about a, a lot of money, um, and and really, you know, that's kind of a, 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 it's just a reactive question that funders are asking. Um, so being able to speak to, and even potentially sharing, you know, here's what it takes to deliver what we want to be able to deliver for the community in terms of the resources. This is the financial um, model that attaches to that in terms of what we would need financially. Um, and then to uh, Kim's point, which is, you know, being able to just communicate clearly saying, this is the scale that we are <laughs> um, financially, of which, you know, audited financials are not really um, part of the mix yet, just because you, you don't really even have enough to do it. Um, but, um, but sometimes just speaking to, um, you know, sometimes it's even the transparency of saying, you know, we have a bookkeeper and we're using, um, you know, QuickBooks to manage our financial um, infrastructure, something like that, depending on what you have. But um, I would say, again, uh, part of that key story is being able to talk about what it takes to to be able to deliver something like this in the community, where those resources are and what it takes for you to actually be able to, to bring them together um that's that's there and and i will just you know share one observation as i'm listening to the story that you're telling uh you know when i was a kid the schools provided all of this <laughs> um it was part of the investment that people made in schools um and i do think that that's part of the story which is you, you know how we think about how the community invests in arts whether it is through public funding and taxation in schools or some other mechanism, that that's an important part of the uh, the story that you're telling in terms of what the community has had or or how the community invests in arts and kids. And I, I kind of had that in the back of my head as as, as the approach to take when it, when it came to that, because typically if if I uh, if I do a grant proposal and they they want an audited statement, I kind of attach my uh, my budgeting sheet with it along with a letter explaining that you know we're a new nonprofit and we're, this is what it's going to take to to get us going here. Are you using a bookkeeper, Charles? Right now we use uh, uh, Ap Aplos which is an online financial management software service. And we also have Gusto, which does uh, for if there are any employees or contract workers that, that need to onboard, we use Gusto to provide that service for us. Um, because that, what I, where I was going with that is that if you have a professional doing your books in some way, that also offers sometimes a little more confidence yeah. than if it's just you. Um, so, and sometimes that professional maybe sits on your board, something like, you know, something like that. And they offer that as the service to get you going. Um, yeah. that, that's the contribution that they're making. Do you have a, you have a board of directors? Right now we have a, we, have, we do have a board of directors and, and it's, uh, it's me and uh, my my fiance. She's on the board, <laughs> and my Dr. Marcus out of uh, San Antonio. She's on our board, and uh, Ernestine Dillard out of uh, Oklahoma City and Tulsa area. She's on our board, and it's a small board. And, and I'd like to increase the membership and on board, but <clears throat> uh, again, I'm not. I'm uh, kind of uncomfortable. I don't know what type of members I need. 
how to approach those folks and, 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 and what to request of them as board members. Well, one of the first things that parents that you need is somebody to help somebody to help you with the financial piece. Yes. <laughs> and how to present that. Um, so um, maybe you can we, let's so let's talk about the, the kinds of things you need in your board and 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 the individuals that you have what they're adding. Um, so generally, when I work with companies, we're, we're looking for definitely financial expertise on your board. So somebody to help you with help you with the 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 accounting. Legal is always a very useful thing to have. Um, you're dealing with children. You're, you're going to probably need somebody to deal with the legal. Um, somebody to somebody who has good fundraising expertise and or people who have good good entree into the world where you know people who can get you money, people who know where to find find the um, the foundations and the funders, perhaps some funders themselves. Um, so, so you, a lot of people, I think, don't realize that really one of the primary purposes of the board of directors for a nonprofit is to fundraise for you. So people who are good at finding money and good at asking for it are very, very good. Um, you might want other expertise as well. Maybe you need somebody who's very good at uh, human resources or it you know, just kind of depends on, on you. You might want um, the people on your board perhaps already have expertise in the teaching of, of children or in in teaching of music so these these are all you know, or, ha, or somebody who's founded a, a similar founded and has a similar kind of nonprofit. so these are the kinds of things i would suggest but i suspect you have others as well and some of these other people might but i think those are your board is a real good place to find these folks and how do you ask um well, well uh, justin just talked about telling your story being able to tell your story and being able to find connections with people. Um, I just recently have been learning about one-to-one -one meetings where primarily I just, when I, me as, I just ask, tell me your story what is and what is valuable to you. And in that you find the things that are of value to them. And if you have a connection, that's when you build, develop the relationship and over time can ask for money. It becomes much more comfortable when you understand what, what it is that drives those people and figure out, okay, well, this is the piece in my, they, they care very deeply about children. They care, care very deeply about uh, learning readiness. They care very deeply about, name it, oh, well, this is what we do to prepare for that. This is what we do in, in supporting that thing that you care very deeply about. Are you interested in joining us? Uh, it sounds, it, it, it sounds simpler than it is, but it, I will tell you, it is it is a process of developing relationships. Okay. Ask, please ask your question. Uh, I mean, is it a good idea? We have a a board member application of sources. Is, is that a good thing to have? And uh, what types of what types of questions do I need to have on on this particular form? You know, I don't, I don't want to scare people off. They, you know, they, oh, boy, the application. And a lot of folks, especially in a smaller town, like they can say, everybody's sort of a word of mouth. This is a word of mouth sort of town. And I, and I, and I don't want to frighten people off as if. You need an application. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's my opinion. You don't want to frighten people off, but you also want them to take you seriously. Okay. You know, you're not there to play. You know, this is. I mean, you are literally to play, but um, um, yeah, I think I think that's a basic thing. Just um, you you filled out an application to get here today. Wasn't that hard? I don't think was it. No. <laughs> I I think people if they're if if they're if they can't settle down enough to spend a few minutes thinking about why they want to do this, maybe they don't really want to do this because you're asking them to work. Yes. You know, this is you are going to be asking them to work, and they should know that from the from the beginning, that there's there's a there's a seriousness and a gravity to what you are doing, and it's worth their time and effort. And, and Charles, building on what Lynn mentioned, my suggestion is absolutely to have an application. I wouldn't call it a board application; I would call it a volunteer application, because someone may 
complete that application and they may be able to add value or to help, but maybe they're not the best person to be on the board, yet they can be a volunteer and there are a lot of ways in which they can volunteer. And then the types of questions you would wanna ask them, you would wanna ask them about their connection to music, their connection to youth, how they can add value, what their experience is, what their experience is in working with other nonprofit organizations or other volunteer groups. The more people who have experience in working with organizations such as yours, usually the better and stronger board members they're going to be. Um, you're gonna to wanna to ask them in addition to their skills, their capabilities, how they can contribute either through the, their, their own funds or through others and what they're willing to contribute. Now, sometimes that would be an application. Often that would be through a conversation. So the application, which definitely would term it as for a volunteer, is an opening for a conversation to discuss where, how, and under what parameters they can get involved, as opposed to it just being bored. Because if it's just bored, it's very difficult to then back up and Maybe they can be a music teacher, or maybe they can assist with other ways that are gonna add value to you and to the community. Yet yeah, would be, uh, would definitely recommend that you put that together. Also wanna come back to where you had referenced audited financials. This is not my area of expertise. At the same time, if you're at about $3,000 and they're asking for audited financials, there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect in the sense of, can you have a conversation with somebody at that, at that organization, the funder, in terms of where they're at, what they're looking to fund, the idea of audited financials for an organization such as yours? The truth is, in my mind, it just doesn't make sense. It, it, it's, it's not a fit. They're probably looking for different types of organizations to fund. And do you want to spend your time writing the grant for that type of organization where you haven't had a discussion with them? And in a discussion with them, you'll be in a much better situation to determine, well, should I spend the 10, 15, 20 hours to write this up? Or should I have a half hour conversation to figure out maybe it's not a fit? It makes a lot of sense, yeah. Charles, are there other questions that you have? Um, not, uh... Not as pressing as the, uh, the audited financial statements and the board member questions. You know, those, those are items that have kind of been rolling around in my head that I that I couldn't come up with a solution for. It, and you guys have given me. Uh, and we can send some resources to you related yes. to specific questions that you may want to ask of volunteers or of board members, potential board members. So to get this up and running, since since we talked we talked about this before, how much? And what's it cost to run? It it for for us to operate for a year, uh, it would cost one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars for a year. Yeah, and and, and and a lot of people say it. You know, oh, that's that's not very much in. <clears throat> I've never had to deal with that huge of <laughs> that huge of a number to to try to raise funds for. And so, one hundred thirty-five thousand to one hundred fifty thousand a year to me seems like a huge amount. But I, I think once we get into this, I'll, I'll, it'll it'll start to realize to me that it's really not that much. And that will buy serve, that will buy what for how many students? That will give uh, let me remember it was 65, 65 students a year of lessons in, in for for that amount of money. Yeah. And you're using volunteer teachers? How are this you? This is so this is this is anticipating that we'd have to uh, have some economic incentive for the instructors to, to come on board. Yeah. So you'll pay them something, but probably. yes, we'll, we'll pay them something. And mm -hmm. our thinking is uh, for the beginner students, the, the fourth and fifth grade students, we could use <clears throat> we could use a high level uh, uh, junior senior college music majors to teach those to teach those courses, and they would get 
uh, a little bit of you know economic incentive to do it for students that that would be a great a great addition to what they need and it would also provide them with teaching experience upon their graduation and, where's your uh, where, where's your college you have, you have a close one we have a uh, houston college here uh, in houston then we have college of the mainland they have a music program also and those are the two places where we're going to focus our recruitment for for college students um, do, have you talked with them yet i have not and <laughs> that's, that's oh my god talk with them they might partner <laughs> they might help you fund it yes they might help they might well help you fund it partner with them because their kid their students need teaching experience and they this teach when you teach another person how to make music you yourself become a far better musician and most of these are going into pedagogy anyway the vast majority of them are going to become teachers you know because there's you know, most of them will not become profession, professional musicians. It's, you know, at least straight performers. And even yeah. straight performers all teach anyway. Oh my gosh, have, a, gosh, call these people. <laughs> 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 That's where I'd start, and, you know, and, and see, see how they can help. For all you know, they're looking for experiences for their students. Absolutely, <laughs> I, I absolutely will, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I love that idea. I really do. I think that's a, a really smart idea. And I mean, will you start with the youngest children? You know, how, you know, where, where's the you know, step by step of how you're. you're the motivated. step by step is uh, we will offer after, it'll be an after school program, of course. Uh, the fourth and fifth grade beginners will be on Mondays and Wednesdays. And then our, our seventh and eighth graders that have some experience because they've been in sixth grade band or uh, the previous year will be on Tuesdays and uh, Thursdays. Our high school students and we will try to recruit professional music instructors for the high school kids. Uh, we have a program that we want to use. The Arlington School District in D.C. has a, has a wonderful band program. So we're going to take their band program uh, resource booklet that they have, and we're going to use that for our for the high. college students. Will use that program to maintain some sort of a consistency with the students. You know, in case this trumpet player, this trumpet instructor can't be there Monday, and the, the trumpet instructor that replaces him will will use the same program, the same booklet, and the same uh, pacing in order to keep the kids on track. And do they know that? Have you had the, that conversation with Arlington yet? I've, I've contacted uh, one of the band instructors in Arlington. I haven't got word back, but I'm going to keep on those folks and, and uh, to make sure that, that uh, I'm, I'm able actually to use their to use their program references. And Charles, good for you for looking to others, whether it's in Arlington or elsewhere for, for guidance, for insights, no sense in recreating the wheel. So I'll give you a lot of credit for that. Could you maybe walk us through the business model? You mentioned grants, you mentioned um, looking at that for as potential source of revenue. Where do you see and how do you see uh, the income that you're going to generate to cover that 135,000 in expenses? Uh, uh, some like the grant, I mean, the grant application that we have, we, we're also applying for, uh, I have some contacts with the city of Dickinson and the, the, the Dickinson Management District provides funding for different organizations in the city. And we, we're gonna apply for a portion of the, uh, our funding to come from those from those folks as well. And they also have locations in the city that uh, are open for leasing. And we're gonna uh, get in with that as well. We have some fundraising uh, ideas that we're gonna, we're still working through some of the kinks of uh, of getting of getting those fundraising apparatus up and, and running, 
And the major one is going to be what, what we call our, our 10 percenters. Uh, we'd like to have, we're going to, like I said, Dickinson is small, it's 21,000 residents. And we're going to push our local fundraising to, like I said, 10 percent of the population to donate uh, $50 a year. And we're going to push 10% of the businesses to donate $200 a year. And if we can, uh, we can get that fundraising to, to, the, to the level that we anticipate, it, it will take care of you know, 60 to 70% of what we need. But it, the, the major thing is that they're all be considered 10%. That's, that's kind of like our catchphrase for this fundraising drive. And for the fundraising drive, either on your board or others within the town of, of Dickinson, are there leaders within the community that you're involved with that can help uh, champion this cause, champion the fundraising effort? Because often when it comes to raising funds, having individuals either connected with music, connected with the town, connected with, with you and, and the mission and where you're going, having those individuals active and involved is a key part of, of developing and, and executing that type of fundraising campaign. Absolutely. Actually, I, 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 I sat with the uh, city manager just this weekend, and I uh, also sat with the, uh, the president of the Economic Development Council here in Dickinson, and they're going to help me as, as much as they can, you know, outside of their normal job duties. And I do have the one of the city councilman, he's uh, I actually, we are actually ran for city council uh, a couple of years ago. So I'm, I'm good friends with those guys that are on the city council as well. <clears throat> and they've all, they've all stated that they would assist me in, in whatever I Good for you for being able to make those contacts and to reach out to them, to connect with them. That should be a big boost in terms of connecting with them and with others when it comes to beginning to raise funds. And Lynn, you may want to chime in about the development resources. I'm, I was so thrilled to hear you mention the economic development, the, the, Dick, uh, the Dickinson uh, Economic and Development Council or Corporation. So, um, yeah, you said you spoke with the president. So that's probably the president of the board, or is it the CEO? Two different things. The the CEO. Okay, so it is their job <laughs> to help you. You said, oh, aside from that, what they have to do? No, no, it is their job to help you. So um, that as economic, I mean, I'm an economic development professional. That's what the CECD mean in in back of my name means. Um, so as economic development professionals, it is our job to help the people in our community to start and grow businesses. And they have, I, I'm sure, tons of resources in the community and the surrounding area that can help you. There's probably a small business development center. There's probably, you know, there, there may be just all kinds of things that they know about that I don't because they're pretty localized to the area. Um, there's also, uh, I looked it up, um, it's called, uh, it's Develop Galveston County. It's the Dickinson Galveston Economic Development Council. Yes. I don't, do you know that one about that one? That one looks like it's the countywide one. It's a countywide. Uh, I, I wouldn't. I mean, if you haven't connected with them, I would. Yeah. <laughs> I would for sure. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just kind of a, most people don't realize that your local economic developer just knows pretty much everybody in town and will happily make make uh, connections for you, make introductions. They can also let you know if there are some specific funding opportunities that where you might it might just fit right in um maybe maybe there's a nonprofit incubator down there kind of similar to nonprofit village uh they're real i think they will be one of your could be some of your strongest supporters and free <laughs> free is the right prize <laughs> so um you sound like you're you sound actually like you're a pretty good networker so that's going to help a lot um chambers of commerce I have not joined the chamber, the local chamber of commerce, as of yet. But that's that's on my next. It's actually my next stage along my my timeline is to, to join the chamber. I yeah. have a. I have to give a speech to the Rotary 
club uh, next week, I believe, introducing my organization. And then after that, I'm going to visit the city council meeting, the next city council meeting, and do an introduction for us there and uh, start to get to, to get our, our, our name out there and so in front of the public more. Mm -hmm. So uh, city, uh, so Rotary, I'm a big fan, so good for you. Uh, Rotary, Kiwanis, Lions, all of those, you should be making the rounds. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm of, I love chambers because they're good at helping you find all the other businesses and, and you're hoping to generate that money. You will be a little bit of competition for them. So, cause yeah, so just kind of be aware of that. Um, but they can be your friends. They, you know, they do fundraisers too. So just, just be aware. Um, they cost money. My feeling about joining a chamber is that if you don't have time to put into the chamber itself, you probably shouldn't be joining a chamber, but like I said, they are good ways to access other businesses. So you can, you know, in a town of 21,000, you don't want to ignore them for sure. So it's, it's going to be, a, it's just going to be, and you can ask them, you can, you know, can talk to them about, you know, uh, you know, I'm just getting this off the ground. We're just getting going. You know, we know that we're looking for money too, but I, I also know that if I were to join you, I have to, I need to give my time to you. And I don't know if I could do that properly. So just, you know, but I like, it's just too small a town to ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't ignore it. You can't ignore anybody in a, in a town that size, but um, doesn't sound like you are. Um, um, in your application, oh my God, it's only 10 minutes left. Uh, do you want to talk about uh, the school district thing or do you have something else going on that you want to talk about? Uh, the, the school district, I uh, ha have a little of uh, a disconcerting attitude because I reached out to those guys and I got kind of a, a little bit of a pushback and I didn't know how to respond or, re or react to it. I didn't know if it was, uh, maybe they feel a little threatened by what we're doing. I, I, I'm not certain, but we, I get, we, we got a little pushback from, from those guys. I didn't, I didn't reach out to the high school band director. I want to save him for last because I'm sure he has uh, seniority over everyone else. But I spoke with all the grade school directors. I sent, I sent all those guys letters out explaining what we're doing and, and how they could help to uh, uh, to improve their attrition rate as well as the improvement of musicians in, in, in the school district. And I got one letter back from, from one of the guys and I'm sure he's responding for everyone. And it was just, it wasn't, I can understand his, his concerns, but just seemed to be a little bit pushed back and I didn't know how to uh, didn't know how to deal with it. Charles, could you clarify what the pushback was? I have a couple of guesses, but we'd rather hear it from you. Uh, you know, I, I don't come from a, uh, a uh, uh, an educated musical background. And his, his main concern was whether or not I was qualified enough to operate an organization and the impact that it would have on Dickinson ISD, uh, his, his band members, his band, I wish I could remember the word he, he used exactly. But they, they, he seemed to have some real concerns that we would somehow interfere with what with with, the, with their program somehow, I, and, I, and I I could understand that he's concerned that I don't come from a musical background, but I have operated a nonprofit when I, when I was in Phoenix back in the nineties, and so I, I do have some technical ability to operate a nonprofit. But like you said, I don't believe in recreating the wheel, and if I don't have the expertise to take care of something. I believe in getting someone else that does. <clears throat> but he, they really seem to think that for whatever reason that my program was going to, uh, was going to have some adverse effect 
and I think it's an ISD music program. And if I, I wish I had the exact, and I don't have a, a copy of the exact letter to, to put up in front of me so I can give you a more detailed explanation as to his, his concerns, but his, his biggest concern was my lack of musical expertise is a big concern. So I've got a couple of thoughts on that. One, they may be afraid that if the, that if that if you're getting um if you're getting city funding that it'll it'll come from their pocket. Most folks are always afraid of that. It, it shouldn't, but but that may be a, a niggling concern. Um, you said very clearly they seem they're concerned because you don't come from a musical background. Well, you don't. You come from the nonprofit background, and that's fine. You'll hire the musical expertise. You can tell them that. Um, but remember how we talked how earlier I talked about what I'm learning about doing one to one meetings with people and learning what 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 drives them and what their concerns but and also what what their their loves are this might be a good opportunity to step back a bit. Um, so when you first started explaining how you would approach them, you said something about we want to explain what the program is and and what you know and how they can get involved. Yes. As opposed to what the program is and how it would benefit them. I don't know a single band director in the United States that doesn't want more band, more kids in band. <laughs> and is terrified of losing their own kids. Yeah. So I think what you're talking about doing is really enlarging the circle of children in music. The ones who are already there, that's great. They can afford it. They're there. You want to enlarge the circle to the huge population of children who aren't in their programs now. Yes. that can't afford to be in their programs now. And the, you, you know, all, you want to be a feeder system to their programs. You want to make their programs bigger and stronger. And somehow they miss that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, somebody earlier talked about messaging. And, and I mean, I, I would just maybe rethink your messaging a little bit mm -hmm. um, and be thinking, okay, you know, what is it that I'm doing for them? What are the, you know, this doesn't necessarily cost them anything. Shouldn't, frankly. It, you know, run it outside, and then it just benefits them. And if if so, and then maybe that can turn be turned around. I wouldn't expect it out of one meeting, but over time, I I can't imagine. Just seems to me that if I'm a band director, I got 30 kids and all of a sudden I got 40 kids and then I got 50 kids and they were all children who never would have been there before. Um, you know, I mean, then they have other issues, perhaps, but if they're afraid of growth, then that's a whole different thing which you have to deal with with your school board. Yes. So, good luck. <laughs> I'm excited about it, though. We're down to the last two or three minutes. Um, Charles is there. Well, men, have you also had a chance to offer anything that you want to so let me just ask Charles like uh, is there anything questions you know like about communications or marketing that I can help you on uh, where you are um, I, I think my my, my 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 biggest the biggest thing we need help with right now is uh, in, Increasing our 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 contact our contact list, our email okay. contact list, or volunteer contact list, or uh, if if our website is is adequate to 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 accomplish this, and <clears throat> what what I can do to improve upon what we have already. Okay, so before we jump into the website, I think I just, you know, because we running out of time and I'm happy to provide like, you know, follow up with you. Uh, but one thing I would um, recommend is, have you heard of the thing called the story of uh, the story of self, the story of us and the, the story of now? Have you heard of that before? No, I haven't. So it's basically the framework and then you can use this for, you know, increase your contact list, share your vision and things like that. So basically the story of self is how you 
come into the problem, you know, how, what you believe in, uh, what your background information, and the story of us turn into uh, whoever you related to, right? Whether it's the funder or it's a potential partner in terms of the music school and things like that. And, you know, like where they're coming from, how you align with them, why are you having that meeting in the first place, right? And then the last thing is the story of now, giving that urgency into helping them. Uh, why do we need, you know, why we need to take action now, right? Like, uh, what's the urgency about that? What's so important about that? So you can even look it up online. Like there's some, a lot of YouTube talking about um, that framework and actually it's been taught at the Harvard University um, as well. So, you know, like once you master that three to five minutes uh, story of self, story of us and story of now, you can use that in terms, you can even, you don't even need a website. Let's just say that for now, right? You can even like have a, for a video phone, uh, a camera, just record you talking about that in like three, four minutes, send it to people, you know, like send it to the email, put it in your email list, you know, like before people meet you, this is what I believe in. This is uh, just a little bit about you, right? So in that way, uh, it will become like really cool to see that. That's the most, uh, that's the least uh, effort <laughs> that you can do. And once you do that, you get a lot more support. Then you can think about, you know, like, okay, now the website, the or the social media and things like that. But everything come with you first because you are the founder, you, you have the visions, right? And you have the energy that people should feel excited when they talk to you. So that's what I'm trying to capture that, right? So don't need anything fancy as long as the video cameras record who you are just like right now. And then the audio is good, just like we're hearing, everything is perfect. People can get through that, you know, like a short video about you. So that's what I would recommend to look up. Yeah. And it's actually a, a good idea. I'm, I'm kind of a low key person, but I, I can uh, think I can muster up enough excitement for for a quick video. <laughs> it takes practice. Like I don't, it takes practice and practice. And then, you know, we make mistakes, but people get to learn who you are and your passion versus they're reading your bio and you send it to them, right? You know, it's just a different way to differentiate yourself with other people and people get to hear from you. Because, um, you know, we live in that world, like, you know, where virtual reality and things like that, make it as a strength for you, send it to people before you even meet with them first. Uh, see how many people send it to Kim and then ask him to connect you with other people. <laughs> that could be one way, right? Uh, yeah, it's, that's it's, actually a really good idea. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, so practice that, you know, two to five minutes uh, video and just you in front of camera talking and then add some photo or, you know, like there's so many ways you can make it uh, prettier and more engaging, but the basic function functionality of that video is just uh, communicate who you are, what you do and why your work matters and why they need to invest in you, why need, they need to give you money or partner with you to make the vision re become a reality. So, yeah. So that's everything I have. All right, we are uh, out of time, but um, Charles, I also want to, I was just looking up, uh, you're near Houston? Yes, we're about 30 miles south of Houston. Okay, so Houston has an Arts Alliance incubator and they're one of our partner um, nonprofit centers in the country. There's about 300 of us around the country. And, and they have a program called the Management Assistance and Organizational Development Enterprise. They select arts-related organizations to help them through the incubation period. Okay. So I will, I will get the contact information. And when Lily sends out the video of this meeting and the notes, she'll include all of that information for you. And you can contact them and see how they can help you locally. Because your state... Um, your state nonprofit association actually dissolved last year. Uh, I used to be in touch with the, the Texas Association of Nonprofit Organizations a lot, and they decided to shut down. So, um, so you don't have a, I don't think you have a state association anymore, but this, this could be a start for you as well. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, panel, thank you so much. If you'll stay on for just a second, Charles, thank you for being with us today. Uh, give us a couple of days. We'll get all of the uh, video and notes back out to you. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me directly.
Okay. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you, folks. This was helpful. All right. All right. Good luck, Charles. Oh, thank you.